Let's talk to Reverend Alan Busak that is now on the line with us. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Tashrik. It's good to be with you again and good morning to all the listeners. Thanks, thanks certainly for being here. I, I saw somewhere, I can't recall, but I saw somewhere, I think an article or some commentary in newspaper in which you kind of argue the same thing, not necessarily completely aligned with what Lindy Mrs. Sulu had to say there, but you're basically saying that an ANC DA alliance is almost doomed to fail. Why, why is that the case? Well, it's not only doomed to fail, I think it is a complete disaster. Uh, in the long run for the African National Congress, but certainly, and even in the short run for the country, for the people of South Africa. I mean, it's not just that a, the policies in conception are diametrically opposed, because in many ways, the policies that the ANC have been following, especially economic policy, that the ANC has been following, uh, for the last uh, 30 years, but especially under uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa, that those policies align perfectly with the new liberal capitalist views of the Democratic Alliance. And those are the same policies that we now see that have very, very detrimental consequences for our people. Um, those are the policies that have uh, continued the unbroken cycles of impoverishment of the masses while it continued the enrichment of the few. It brings a greater emphasis on uh, social cohesion or the impossibility of building social cohesion because of the social economic inequalities that is built in into in new liberal capitalism. It, 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 it is a necessity for that uh, economic system to have high employment, to have a weak labor force, to have weak laws that keep, that keep uh, uh, businesses in check. And so it seems to me that that is at the heart uh, of what economically has become our woes and has subsequently branched out to other areas of our. So in that area, they are, they are almost aligned, but that says to me that the disaster that's going to follow as you cement these policies between the DA and the ANC, that's going to be, it seems to me, the most important partners of this coalition or this or this government of national unity, as they call it. And so it seems to me, for me, that would be one of the most important things. And also the ANC as an organization that historically has claimed very, very different views on society, on the future, on policies than the, than, than, than the DA. Now we'll have to work with the DA, and it seems to me we'll have to work under the leadership of the DA in this new formation that we're going to see. I see all sorts of growing difficulties, Tashrik. I see all sorts of tensions, and the tensions within government are going to spill over almost automatically into our society. There's a lot of people that have been telling me, you know, since election night and post that May the 29th, that there's something terribly exciting about the period that we're in right now. Voters have spoken, you know, they've diminished power from all of the major parties, even though the ANC sits with a majority 40% there. And while some accept that there are very many things wrong with the ANC, um, the ANC is... For, for some at least, a, a vehicle through which um, there is still some sort of semblance of alignment with the working class and ordinary people as opposed to the sort of ultra, uh, either centrist, right-wing approach of the Democratic Alliance, as has been described by, by some people on this program. And I'm not entirely convinced that the outcome that we have right now is the best possible outcome purely because we have then, you know, parties throwing around their own personal interests to determine what sort of levers of power they can get closest to in order to push through what only they feel terribly passionate about. And even the proposal now with the government of national unity uh, as being proposed here by the ANC, and again, the modality of exactly how that will come together remains certainly to be seen. It takes us into a greater level of fragmentation as opposed to, 
you know, some sort of a semblance of a contestation of ideas between one or two big parties that we kind of understand where they where they where they go. Um and so I'm I'm not going to be able to discern exactly what is going to be the the policies of a government, one government, albeit with different parties that will now come together, what that could potentially be. And so I, I take a little bit of a dim view about what was the outcome of this elections. I'm not sure whether you perhaps see it any differently. Well, uh, that is that is absolutely a very interesting point of view. Look, a government of national unity is what they are calling it now. But at the outset, it was clear that the ANC was looking for a coalition with the DA and with the DA alone. It was only the very, very fierce resistance that have sprung up from everywhere, uh, from some circles uh, within the African National Congress, but certainly from many people and many formations outside of the of the ANC in civil society that has stopped it. Now, then in the last few days, I then noticed that they stopped talking about a coalition. Uh, they now talk about a government of national unity. And it's a bit deceptive uh, what they are trying to, a bit, I mean, it's a lot of deception because they are making believe and making us believe that a government of national unity is something like we had uh, in 1994, evoking all those images of the country coming together after a great period of, of, of animosity and struggle and bloodletting and so forth. Um, now we've had struggled over the last 30 years but we have had a totally different situation. That government of national unity that they now sort of claim the name for was built upon the, 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 the presentation of a reconciliation uh, that did not really exist. And that is why it fell apart so soon. And so that is why you are right. We must not sit here with great expectations, thinking that the name alone um, will will bring us back to a, a situation where the country can be governed by the will of the people. The DA has no intention whatsoever to govern by the will of the people. The DA governs by the will of the white minority. Let's be clear and let's be honest about that. In my view, the DA still is, I suppose, the most successful new colonialist project um, on the continent, and it is very determined to do so. Secondly, the African National Congress is an extraordinarily weakened party as a party, as an entity. It has fragmented, it is divided amongst itself. A house divided cannot stand. It is not sure about which policies it will go. It still says it's, 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 it stands for the working class, but every single move, every single policy that it had made had been uh, uh, against the interest of the working class, ordinary people. If you cling to new liberal capitalism, that alone takes you away from the interest of the working class. It serves the interest of the few uh, 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 already enriched capitalists. And that, that is clear. Now, it seems to me that you cannot bring those two things together when the ANC has very little left of what it proposed to be in 1994 or what it promised the people to be. And so it's weakened. In that situation, Tashri, the DA will be the dominant partner of this coalition or this government of national unity. And the DA will force its own leadership and its own views upon the ANC. That's, that's point number one, because the ANC as an entity has weakened itself almost beyond redemption. The second problem that we have is that the leader with which, with whom the ANC is now going into this new formation is the same leader, Mr. Ramaphosa, who is responsible for the greatest weakening of the African National Congress in the time that he has been president. Economically, we have gone down more than ever before. People can, uh, who are the experts economically keep on telling us that. Politically, 
We have uh, uh, landed ourselves in a quagmire because of Mr. Ramaphosa. Mr. Ramaphosa himself is a man who is the president of the country, and yet he is living under a serious, serious cloud or several clouds. The Pala Pala matter has not been cleared up and can be brought up and should be brought up at any time. Marikana has not been cleared up and should be brought up and will be brought up in a new parliament, I hope. Mr. Ramaphosa is extraordinarily vulnerable. And who has the greatest grip on Mr. Ramaphosa? It's the DA. We have heard Mr. Sienation explain in public how on the Palapala matter, they have written to Sars. And they have gotten confirmation from Mr. Kisvetter that Mr. Ramaphosa on that particular point of the dollars have been found to be compliant. Now, that is almost absolutely impossible um, because you cannot bring in millions and millions and millions of dollars into the country, not declare it, <clears throat> and then afterwards be declared by SARS to be compliant. So that issue hangs there. Not only that, Mr. Stianazen has then announced that they at the DA have written not only to SARS, but to the FIC. Uh, whether they got a response from that, I'm not clear on. But they have also written to the Federal Bureau of Investigation of the United States of America. Now, and the FBI has been asked to do an investigation on this matter on the question of money laundering. Now, I am not privy to what the FBI had said, but think of it, a president and the end of this investigation of the FBI, a president that still has to give proper answers to issues here, to SARS and to the FIC, and the people who seems to sit with the evidence and the and the and, and and the power in hand to make life for him impossible because every single one of those are impeachable offenses. If if these things are reopened, it may be clear that Mr. Ramaphosa has lied to Parliament or has misled Parliament. That's all impeachable. Now, if I said with that sort of Democles over the president head, who do you think is going to determine policies? Who do you think is going to determine who sits in cabinet? Who do you think is going to determine who has the chairpersonship of all of those important committees? Who do you think is going to give direction, not just for domestic policy, but international policies? And we know that on international policies, we may talk about that later, the DA is on the other side of the spectrum. Um, of what the ANC pretends to be, and certainly where the vast majority of the people are. And so people must not be deceived that this is going to be a government of national unity. I do not want to be cynical, Tashri, but I think always, this is not the time that we must ask our question, is this going to be a government of national unity, or is this going to be a government of the return of white rule? And that is, I think, the issue that we must put on the table and try to unpack as clearly as possible. Let's, 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 let's do so. Let's do so. Because on the one end, as you have articulated what you believe the DA represents, uh, the other you know, part of the spectrum was a suggestion around, um, you know, the ANC coalescing the black parties, um, meaning the Economic Freedom Fighters and potentially the MK party. The MK party... I don't fully really understand what they what they mean, what they they think their purpose is going to be. I've 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 looked at a very paltry manifesto, um, and I've heard utterances made by Jacob Zuma at some public meetings in which he, he talks, for instance, about the chiefs, you know, being the alt, the, the final arbiters of issues in, in society. He had some very other colorful ideas about the way the affairs of the country ought to be run. And there was a very lengthy interview that EWN did with him, a sit down with him at Nkanda in the aftermath of this election, in which he talks about him starting MK and the role of MK to correct the ANC because the ANC has veered off from the path and he terms this to be the ANC of Ramaphosa. And so, and so it would seem to me from reading the room at the moment, it's between what you've described, you know, as the one part of the spectrum, you know, the sort of white rule or white <clears throat> dominance uh, in our body politics, as it were, and what that represents, versus a, a an EFF that seems to be quite passionate about a couple of things and the way it believes it, it must get there. 
and a an MK that is in the mainstream media, whether it's accurate or not, but it is being described as you know ethno nationalist politics, uh, as it were. And so, given the 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 wide pull push and pull factors there on both of those ends of the spectrum, is there some sort of a centrist you know scenario that could emerge from between those two? Thank you for for that question because it's important. Look, I mean, uh, lots of what <clears throat> is interpreted uh, from what MK represents, I am not so sure of. I've heard Mr. Zuma also say, for instance, that he is not interested in putting together a government should he win that would come only out of MK or only out of a certain group he was very clear that he would like to invite people from outside MK to be part of a government, should they. That was in the days that they were still talking about sort of this two-thirds majority. Um, lots of political leaders say lots of very uh, objectionable things. Um, one of the things that this new situation brings us to is that we would bring all of those people around around the table now not all of the black parties um that Ms. Sisulu calls them not all of the black parties are parties that i would like to see have a strong influence on government not all of the black parties have their roots in the struggle for liberation uh, of our people um, but all of them pretend and all of them have made proclamations. So we should, we should keep them to their proclamations if they should come around the table. And there is, in the end, if you strip away all of the, almost the silliness of campaigning, like Mr. Gayton uh, uh, McKenzie saying uh, he would ban all of the African nationals from, from the country, he would go around, um, go around the hospitals and cut off their their uh, their oxygen. Um, things like that, objectionable things like that, uh, that really uh, are, are, are not only politically, but humanly offensive. Um, but they know that those are not things that can be, that can be turned into any kind of policy. And if you bring them together with people with sound mind, uh, there will be a lot of that silliness that will be chopped off, I believe. I don't know whether it will work. These are uncharted waters, they are unprecedented things. I'm hoping that with all of the, the parties that we know that have proclaimed themselves to have a claim in the fight for the liberation of our people, you have greater pool with them than you have with a party like the DA, who quite openly represents uh, the, 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 the interests of, of, of white people only. And it is the interests of black people that have been neglected, that have been marginalized, that have been sidelined in the last 30 years. The vast majority of our people have been kept outside of whatever benefits our democracy was supposed to be. And those are the people that need now to be brought into, uh, into the center. But key to this, Tazrik, is, and I think you mentioned it, is not just what, it's not just what the policies that they proclaim, it's the kind of leadership that we will need to bring people together to focus on what is necessary, to focus not only on what is ideal, which is true, but what is also practical at this particular point. And I'm not sure whether that leadership within our political system exists at the moment. Let's deal with uh, the other colorful parties that somehow made it into the mix of things. And I want to understand whether you think, uh, Reverend, that that it's a sign of where things may go in the next couple of years or whether it is, you know, a fluke that they managed to to get where they are right now. And that is the, the likes of the patriotic alliance, Gaten McKenzie and 
and and and and even you know action essays herman mashaba that's you know been campaigning on this um either anti-immigrant stance um or very pro-colored nationalist stance uh, as it were i know we we, we we briefly reflected on this ahead of the election uh, but now that we've seen the electoral patterns firm up in the way that they have and with Gaten having you know some sort of seats uh, in the national parliament what do you infer from his voter support well in a situation like this um where there is uh, look let me let me put it this way after 1994 uh, south africa has under the leadership of the african national congress quite deliberately turned our back on our ideals of a non-racial open inclusive society it was clear in the way in which the ANC determined uh, its policies of affirmative action, for instance, um, the way it translated its policies into labor uh, practices, um, in uh, uh, making, making that fateful uh, distinction between uh, Black and then African in particular, which hit so-called colored people very, very hard. And that they experienced as discrimination uh, against them and exclusion of them uh, from, from, from economic well-being uh, and from jobs and from educational opportunities. If you see the, the disparities in terms of how bursaries have been allocated um, for, for students going to university, all of that is true. And when you have policies like that, and when you revive that kind of apartheid, new apartheid practices, not just the, the language, but the practices, then we must not be surprised that you have the rise of all sorts of ethnic nationalisms in our society. Now, I mean, uh, I, 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 have been, I have been one of those, Tashfriq, who from the very beginning, the, the, from the call to form, form the United Democratic Front in January 83 to the key note address at the launch in Mitchell's Plain, to the 25th anniversary at UWC and numerous times since then, every single time I have raised this question. I have said that this is like a snake that you put against your bosom, is like a fire in your lap. Those are the words that I use. I said we have to remember what it is that we fought for. The ANC chose differently. And that is why we have, we have the growth of parties in the Western Cape, like the Colored National Congress, and now broadly even like uh, uh, the Patriotic Alliance, which, which is rooted in this kind of colored nationalism. Because politics, it's easy for politics in a situation like this to exploit the question of ethnic exclusion and ethnic nationalism and play on people's fears and play on people's legitimate grievances to turn that into an appeal. I've always believed that once you have a government that can genuinely overturn these discriminative policies, make it into practices that are genuinely inclusive, return to non-racialism as a practical practice every single day, not just as a far off ideal, those parties will wane because there will be no reason. If you make clear to so-called colored people that when we talk about Africans, you mean Africans, not those who say ethnic Africans and then they exclude colored people and they forget um, about 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 the history of this country, and they forget about the indigenous people of this country mm. and the ingenuity of the Khoi and the San and their descendants. Not when we talk about the land, you act as if the question of the land begins in 1913 or in 1936 instead of in 1652. Now, a government at at at, at national level can overturn that at every level and in many, many ways. And when that begins to happen and it begins to bear practical fruit, all of these nationalist parties will fade. It doesn't matter from which side they come, whether they come from the Cossars or the Zulus or the Colors or whatever it is, those will fade. The, those 
temporary successes in an election like this will be overturned. And so for me, that is why it is so important that you have the kind of leadership that will not be susceptible to these temporary little victories that we can gain from exploiting people's fears and people's experiences, but in making a different kind of policy that will move people in a different way and creating a different kind of atmosphere in which our political discourse takes place and in which our political policy formation will also take place. We are talking to Reverend Alan Busak at this time and uh, happy to take uh, some of your WhatsApp messages. You know, 0786 10 11 12. Uh, Reverend, hang tight for me quickly, very please. I, I, I quickly just want to uh, check in with the next uh, program coming up and we're going to take a break a as well. But as as we take that little bit of a breather, you can maybe just quickly grab a cup of tea or something. It will be away just for two, three minutes. Um, I want to ask you, and as you, you mull about this idea, where do you think it went wrong for the ANC? How did they lose their majority? Is this the natural order of things for for liberation movements that happen to be in power? Um, is it the Jacob Zuma years around, you know, corruption or perceived corruption? Is it the faltering economy and the skewed interests that the ANC had pursued as as some of these scenarios. And maybe as as we begin to wade into those questions to understand whether we've lost a lot more than we think we can gain with a government of national unity. Well, a couple of WhatsApp messages in saying, uh, Viva Reverend Busak, uh, Viva UWC, Viva 786 and Tashirik. 200% ANC turned their back on our people uh, and of color who liberated this Western Cape. Uh, Ahmed Jumabarak to you as well, my brother. I'll play your voice note a bit later in the program. The ANC has been lacking when it comes to service delivery of basic human rights, says another WhatsApp, just as a business has varied experts to handle different departments as one man cannot do it all. In the same way, the parties can share the responsibilities. Uh, that example, the ANC can continue to focus on BRICS and the rest of the other parties must well, uh, must be responsible for underground service delivery to the people and when they are lacking, they need to be held accountable. Uh, that's a little bit of what Ibrahim Fakir designed as uh, the political analyst we spoke to yesterday as a possible scenario of what a coalition arrangement could look like. So now I'll come to the NRA team, we need uh, to clone Reverend Alan Busak. <laughs> uh, Reverend, I'm not sure, would your wife survive another clone of you? I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not certain. <laughs> uh, thanks very much, certainly, for, for holding the line. Let, let's get into that, that bit of the conversation about why you think the ANC lost power um, in the way that it has and whether really the writing is on the wall now 40%, what will it look like in five years? Uh, I mean, where did it, where did it go wrong? Uh, one can say, uh, I mean, the the popular the the popular narrative from the ANC now is that it went wrong um, under the presidency of Mr. Zuma, uh, because that's when all the corruption started. That's when everything became dark. Um, in the <laughs> colorful phrase of Mr. Ramaphosa, but. Um, uh, think about it, think about it. One can argue that the difficulties for the ANC began um, immediately. Remember that the first big scandal was under President Mandela and Mr. Tabu Mbeki. That was the arms scandal. That's the thing that was that to this day has not been adequately addressed. And one of the reasons why is that Key reports that dealt with that scandal, key reports in this country, key reports in Britain, key reports in Germany, and key reports in Sweden have all been suppressed by the governments of those countries because they knew that all of the deals that had been made with South Africa in that arms deal uh, have been reeking of corruption. And so we we still have a muggy picture, even though Terry Prophet Brown's book on that thing gives us a, a very good idea of what was happening. So the corruption, my point is, started already then. And so this thing that I hear from ANC people now is that blame everything on Jacob Zuma is really not fair, not historically, not personally, and not politically, and it's misleading. Um, economically, they say everything went down under Mr. Zuma. But 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 just one thing, 
with Benzuma was president, the rand was something like what, 12 to the dollar? Under Mr. Ramaphosa, it went down, it's now 19 um, to the dollar or something like that. Mm -hmm. So and anyone can see, any analysis can see that there has been a downward spiral and not one person has been responsible for that. I blame the ANC's uh, enthusiastic embrace of the new liberal capitalist system. I think that if we had an alternative economic system, it would have gone better. But that is one point, Tashrit. You can also give, go deeper into history, as I think. I think it went wrong in those secret talks between the elites of the ANC under the leadership of Mr. Tabo and Becky, and between the ANC and the elites of the National Party between 1985 and 1989. That's where all those agreements have been made on economic policy, on sunset clauses, as we used to call them, on how the country is going to be run, on the fact that po political power might be given into the hands of the black majority, but economic power will remain in the hands of the white minority. When those plans were cemented, it made of Codessa almost political theater, because what was discussed as Codessa was already agreed upon between the major two groupings, the ANC and the National Party. And that marriage is what gave us this foundation that is so brittle and so weak that it had to give in. So the ANC almost began to engineer its own demise when it behind the backs of the people. Now, this was 1985. It's always very symbolic for me. 1985 is when the UDF was three years old, two years old. When we were in the streets and when the South African government for the first time realized with the announcement of the first state of emergency that this is a resistance whose back they cannot break, that this is going to spell their end. So instead of then calling for an open discussion with the internal leadership and the external leadership, they then decided, let's go to the ANC in exile and make secret agreements behind the people's back at the same time. So that, that to me is probably where the difficulties for the ANC began. And so it is almost inevitable that over a period of 30 years, those foundations will crack because a house built on sand, the Bible says, will not stand. It will be washed away with the first rainstorms. Now we've had the rainstorms for 30 years and this house is crumbling. And so that's where it went wrong. And so how do you now begin? Because this is in a sense, a new era. It is in a sense, a new situation. It is, in a sense, an unprecedented situation. So we have to begin from scratch. And I thank God that it took us only 30 years to realize that this thing that we have been trying to build is a house that's going to fall in on all our people. Now, how can you, in order to begin anew, to build a new house, use the same materials, go to the same architects, go to the same builders, go to the same people and try to build the new house with the material and the people and the advices of the old house that had broken down. That is what I see. And that is why we have to be so careful. We need a freshness, we need new ideas, we need boldness, we need courage, which is something that we did not see um, in our politicians or in our policies over the last 30 years. We really need to think anew about what does it mean in 2024 that we have been given an opportunity to begin again. And that is the question. That is this though an opportunity, um, you know, which was to, to the end of my, my sort of framing question before we went to the break around whether we've whether we're about to lose the little we've gained, because there's a, there's almost a, you know, for, for some, you know, they they hate the ANC, others are upset with the ANC because they may have diluted the gains made 
you know, at the height of the fall of apartheid and how as there, there were efforts to try, as you've highlighted quite quite eloquently, the the the, the way in which there was a dilution really here of, of some of the gains that were made with those negotiations and those talks. Uh, but for, for others, you know, while they became disenfranchised, particularly those in, in the uh, in the, you know, for the sake of understanding, so-called colored community in Cape Town that became terribly disenfranchised with an ANC that, you know, they believed did not quite fully represent them and was going to represent a lot more, um, you know, of a tribalistic, nationalistic ANC. Uh, but the, the, so while some are upset with the ANC, some, you know, are upset for varying reasons with the party, they feel that the ANC was that liberating vehicle, you know, as imperfect as it was. You know, you talk to somebody from the PAC, they'll tell you how, you know, it was doomed from 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 the early 90s already. But we, we sit with a a scenario in which we, we are in BRICS at the moment. Uh, we are looking, instead of to the West, it's much more stronger to, to, to Asia. We are, you know, in and had the courage the political courage to mount a case at the International Court of, of Justice. Well, as imperfect as a minimum wage is, it's not a livable wage, but it is something from the the, the crumbs that are available at the moment to give workers some some sort of dignity. Uh, we have a commitment to universal access to, to health care as you know, we're not quite sure what the model is going to be around NHI, but there are commitments to these things. The very same sort of broad sets of policies that I'm rambling off here that, you know, doesn't sit well with the Democratic Alliance and particularly with the coalition with the Democratic Alliance. I'm not even certain whether those postures and policies are going to survive. And so did we as a country, as a broader community of, of people with different varying interests, did we lose a lot more here than than what we thought we were gaining with how we've split the vote? Oh, we've been losing. We've been losing all of these things that you are mentioning for a very long time now. I mean, if we had had, and all of those things where you say the ANC is supposed to differ from 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 a party like the DA, now we're going to into this coalition or to this government national unity with the DA being the de facto senior partner because of the weaknesses of the ANC as an organization and the weaknesses of his leadership, especially Mr. Ramaphosa. Um, so we've been losing for a long, long time. What you are saying now, it is not, I mean, why did the ANC turn its back on non-racialism? That's, that's all its own doing. But why did the ANC cling to new liberal capitalism? That's the DA. Why is the ANC so lackluster in its support for Palestine? I use the word advisedly because remember that it took us, the people on the ground, to bring the ANC to the point where they would take certain actions on the international stage on behalf of the people of Palestine. It took us a march for 10,000 and then a march of almost 200,000. The president himself never made a commitment as the government of South Africa. He himself, the foreign minister did, but he never did. And I think he didn't because of his own financial interest with Zionist entities in his businesses that he did not want to offend. And that of his family that he did not want to offend. But we had very simple demands. Not only the ICJ, but we had demands of close this embassy down. We had demands of bring B, uh, BDS into practice. We had demand cut off all trade. We demanded that no ships with arms for Israeli or things for Israel would be in South Africa's port. We did all of that, and none of that was taken seriously. They took the most spectacular thing, and my argument with that is always it was right to do so. It really was the right thing to do so, and I was as proud and happy as anybody. But why take something that is in your power, like shutting down the embassy, like sending the Israeli Zionist uh, representatives home, like that, out that is in your power, and put the power in the hands of an international entity over which you have no control, and the outcome of which you cannot control. And mm. so it's almost as if 
we do the things that we know will give us the reputation, but the things that we can do that can give us results, we do not do. And so for me, those are the questions. Take BRICS. The DA do not want us to go on with BRICS. Mr. Ramaphosa is himself not enthusiastic about BRICS. In this government of national unity, where will we go for the future? I am clear that BRICS is the future. I am clear that working with those countries in Asia, that is the, the new pivot, geopolitically, geoeconomically, that makes it clear to me that's where South Africa would go. Look at what is happening in North Africa with the former French, with the French colonies that, that, that are now rising in ways. Look what Ibrahim Traore is doing as a young man. Look at Sudan. Look at that kind of thing. And mm. say to yourself, how far behind is South Africa on what is developing and how far behind will we be with this new entity? What will the DA do with a new health initiative? They won't, they won't support that. And if they are the, the not the senior partner in numbers, but the senior partners in power and in persuasion and in blackmail over the, Af over the African National Congress and its president, that's where we're going to go. And so it seems to me that people must not say, well, you know, we have been able to do this and this. And I always say to people, don't think in politics uh, of what we must do in terms of what our people need. Think of what our people deserve. And when you use the word what our people deserve, which is what the ANC pledged. Now, I, I campaigned with Mr. Nelson Mandela in those years before 94. And I know what the ANC pledged to the people. And so if we worked on what the people really deserve, we would have different policies, we would have different outcomes. We would not be in a situation where we were now. If the ANC had given half the attention and energy and investment um, into giving the people what they deserve, as he did in pleasing the white minority capitalist class, South Africa would be in a very different situation. And that is the way I look at this. And that is the way I'm thinking now. I talk of an opportunity because this is now the new reality. Mm. Unless, this, unless these elections are declared null and void, which perhaps they should have been, and, 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 and then we, we sit with this. Now, how do we, how do we get out of this? And for me, the first point of consideration, Tashri, is not the political parties and what they bring to the table. My point is, what is it what the people of South Africa at this point in our lives deserve? And if you make that the focal point of your discussions, if you make that the needle point that takes you into the future, um, then I think we will have a different kind of thinking. So I'm pleading not just for the parties to come together. I'm pleading for people like yourself, media, uh, civil society, whoever, to create a different climate for our present political discourse to take place and to exert a lot more pressure. No more sitting back, no more arguing about little nitty bitty nonsense, thinking of the issues that matter and making clear that the politicians understand they will not sit one foot in front of the other without taking cognizance of what we want as the people and how we will hold them accountable. Not just when they are in government, but right now, while they're talking about government, because it's not a government for them. It's a government of the political party. It's a government for the people. And that is what should guide us. And so to be vigilant equally to where we are heading and how to hold to account, as you rightfully say, Reverend Alan Busak, those that um, are, are forming up this this power that they think they're going to be having. Uh, but, you know, through the eye of the needle, as they would say, you know, we should be very much vigilant and hold to account the, the type of... Uh, persuasions that you know comes from the ground and not you know necessarily set by by business and you know other powers politically or so that wish to design a, a system that really keeps the public absent or the the vote the electorate out of this uh, conversation uh, reverend we we are of time as we usually do run with you and uh, you know we, we do have lots of fun uh, engaging your mind and your thinking on these issues and i hope to do it again very very soon thanks very much for having join us have a lovely weekend and uh, we treasure certainly your contribution to to the discourse here on on radio 786 uh, reverend alan
Julian Busak there. Thanks very much for yeah, thank having Thank you so much for this conversation and for the service you do to our people. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Reverend Alan Busak.